Hello everyone, I'm Oliver Nina, I'm a graduate student at the University of Central Florida. Today I'm going to be talking about Connectionist Temporal Classification for Offline Handwriting Recognition. So there is different types of text and type text is much, uh, much easier to rec be recognized than handwriting. Uh, handwriting is much more difficult and as we're going to see, uh, maybe we can solve both using similar methods. So for type text, we can use OCR libraries and OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition and some of the most popular ones are Tesseract and also OCR Opus. These both were used by the Google Books project which was to upload uh, and scan um, books and newspapers and upload them online and this last one the OCR Opus uses recurrent neural networks so here's an example of what OCR Opus does and after training it for 100,000 iterations we can see that it starts doing a pretty good job of recognizing the text and the images um, here's another example and we can see that uh, the recognition rates are very high. We can recognize numbers as well as symbols. So that's pretty good, good job at doing the text recognition. What's here opus also does page segmentation binarization. And at the heart of the tool, there is the recurrent neural network or LSTM that is being trained. So what are recurrent neural networks? Recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, are used to solve sequential problems, such as speech recognition, music classification, or handwriting recognition. Here in this example, we see a sequence, and we're trying to uh, predict the sequence. And the blue line is the ground truth, and the black line is our prediction. Here we're using LSTM to do the prediction. As you can see, the feeding of the polynomial is very good, um, and we can do that through recurrent neural networks. So, what is a simple RNN, sometimes called vanilla RNN? Um, it's a function, an activation function that takes in the input xt at time t and the previous activation function at t minus 1 and they're multiplied by these parameters w and u which are the parameters that are going to be learned through a stochastic gradient descent. We also included the bias term b and also the they're modulated by the sigmoid function and to find the target we're also going to input the activation function ht and also multiply it by another set of parameters W and in this case we can think of it as a black box the RNN so this whole formulation could be here as a black box and we're going to input um, a sequence at time 0, time 1, time 2 and time t and we're going to try to predict what should be the target given that input. Also at every input step we're going to be dependent on the current input and the previous um, activation function and we can unroll this loop and have a very long sequence and try to learn that sequence so one main inheritance problem that RNNs have is that they're difficult to train because of exploding gradient. And here we can represent the error being propagated through a stochastic gradient descent as a product of the partial derivatives of one layer uh, with respect to the previous layer. And when we take the norm, we can um, put a threshold as the upper bound for that norm, which is going to represent our error here and t is the number of time steps and k is the longest uh, time step that we need to go back 
And as the number of steps that we need to back up, go back is large and our error is very small, then the error is going to vanish, going to be, become very small. Or it could also explode if the error is greater than 1. So it could either quickly vanish or explode. And that's why it's difficult to train RNAs. So in order to deal with that problem, we use gradient clipping to try to prevent from exploding gradients. Um, another solution is to add gates to the formulation. Um, and the long short term memory is a, a memory unit that uses several gates to avoid um, the vanishing gradient problem. And the greater recurrent unit is a newer unit that um, just came out and also tries to prevent um, this problem in recurrent neural networks. So I'm going to be talking more about long short term memory in this talk. And um, this was discovered in 1997 by Coach Ryder and Schmidt Huber. And they proposed to add four gates to the formulation. This is the for gate, gate, the update gate, output gate, and input gate. And they're all going to take in the sequence at time t and the activation function at t minus 1. We're also going to have parameters for each one of those gates that we're going to learn through stochastic gradients in, and also be modulated by a sigmoid function. We're also going to have a cell state memory, which is going to combine these gates uh, in the following way. We'll have a forget gate that is going to be multiplied through a Hadamard product with the previous uh, cell state at t minus 1. And we're going to add uh, the multiplication of the input gate with the update gate. And the intuition behind this is that sometimes we're going to uh, want to forget certain sequences certain steps in the past. So if we want to forget a, a state, t minus 1, we're going to give more weight to this part of the term. And so this term will try to forget um, past time steps. And this other part of the, of the term of the formulation is going to help us remember current um, inputs being passed to the memory cell. Uh, finally, to calculate the activation function, we're just going to pass the cell state to a sigmoid function and multiply it through a Hadamard product with the output gate, which is going to modulate the output to the next LSTM. Here we have a representation of the LSTM, and we're inputting the sequence time t and activation function at t minus 1 and multiply those through the weights um, for each of the gates and then be modulated by the sigmoid functions. We're going to combine them through the uh, memory cell and here there is a loop that indicates that we're going to be using the previous uh, cell state for, for that um, uh, formulation of the memory cell. And finally modulated by a sigmoid function to calculate the activation function at time t. So we can treat it again as a black box. Um, here the LSTM uh, can be unrolled through uh, the sequence. And we're going to pass an, an input sequence at every time step and try to predict the y term for every uh, time step. In this case, we're trying to recognize text. So we're going to treat the image of the text as a sequence, where every column is going to be an input to one of the LSTMs. So column 1 will be here. Column 2 will be on the next step. Also, the feature dimension is going to be the height or uh, of our image. <clears throat> and for our experiments, we treat um, all the images 
scale down to um, a 45 dimension height and the width is going to depend on the length of the image and the number of words in the image. So we can have a long image uh, or a small image pass through this sequence of LSTMs and learn what the label for each of those rows is. It could be a, a blank space or a letter in the alphabet. Um, so to learn the layer, the connection is temporal classification layer is going to help us to calculate the loss um, for our stochastic gradient descent to train our LSTM. So a CTC layer was used initially for speech recognition um, and the main idea is to try to align the prediction to the target. It uses a forward and backward algorithm that will calculate the probabilities of that alignment and will use those probabilities as the um, loss function for our stochastic gradient descent. So um, given a sequence X, we want to calculate what's the probability of label L being predicted. And we can calculate the margin of that and we're going to find out that is the sum of all the paths pi given the sequence X. And we can approximate this probability through the forward backward algorithm um, by summing over all the forward probabilities and backward probabilities. And we can calculate the probability of our prediction through the forward backward algorithm. And since we need to minimize this uh, probability for our stochastic gradient descent, we use a negative sign to minimize this function, which is our objective function for the algorithm. So now that we've talked about how LSTM work, we're going to put it um, in practice and we'll input an image, uh, in this case a handwritten text image, and we're going to do some pre-processing to it in order to input it into our LSTMs. Um, we're using the transcriptorian data set in order to uh, use these cropped images that have been cropped and labeled manually. And the first um, pre-processing step is to do this slanting. So we're going to calculate the angle that the text has been written and try to de-warp the text um, by that angle. As you can see, this image has been de-warped or de -slanted, and now it's much easier to calculate the features across the image. We also do contrast normalization, which is going to help us stretch the histogram of the image and normalize the pixels between 0 and 1. So this is our input to the LSTM. We're also going to pre-train or use a pre-trained model, which has been trained on type text in order to initialize the weights of our uh, new LSTM that we're going to train on handwriting. And after 160,000 iterations um, trained on handwriting, we're going to see that uh, the model starts learning the letters. It also starts learning uh, some of the dependencies between the letters come through the alignment of CTC. Here's another example. However, the algorithm needs uh, many more iterations in order to converge. And so if we increase the number of iterations um, to 465,000, then we'll see that the algorithm starts learning some of the words that it's seen um, frequently in the, in the training set. Eight, two, many. Here's another example. It fails in some of the words that hasn't seen very frequently, such as knowledge here. 
and on the other words you can see it starts recognizing them you can also see that the image is kind of hard to to uh, read even for humans but the algorithm does a fairly good job here's another example so this tells us that the more iterations we give it the more it could learn however this training process is very expensive um, it took me more than a week to train the model and so and even then it wasn't perfect it needed more iterations so one of the drawbacks of this model and the algorithm is that it's based on python and it's very slow to train also um, it's difficult to do research in this area because if we want to try different units such as the GRU unit or other LSTM units we'll have to calculate our derivatives manually and do debugging and all that and it could be a pain so there are different solutions to tack both problems um, for instance we can parallelize the code using GPUs one way to do that is to use CUDA and we could use native CUDA to to recode the process and, and try to parallelize the algorithm or we can use other languages such as Torch and Tiano that run on CUDA underneath so we opted to use Tiano because it's much easier to code in and also runs CUDA underneath um, and we saw an improvement in performance training went down uh, to one-fourth of the time and another advantage of using Tiano is that we don't need to manually uh, calculate the, the partial derivatives and deltas for the gradient descent and we can explore more um, using different units and in other configurations so those are advantages of using Tiano in this case um, so our implementation of the code for the CPU version is in this github repository and for the Tiano version is here our Tiano version is still under development we still have quirks that we need to solve but you can help us um, improve it um, if you have any questions you can email me and I just want to thank the reviewers and Dr. Bear for the discussions and suggestions and everyone for uh, your time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the workshop.